Please don't skip ahead yet. Hi, this is your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian, Josh LaRue. Just need a moment of your time. A lot of people don't know, but we're not able to monetize the channel here on YouTube due to the fact that the copyright holders of the books I narrate, the movies we rip, they get the ad revenue, and also being a partner on YouTube involves a lot of rules and censorship, and to do so would make it where a lot of the content, the audiobooks, the riffs, would have to be heavily censored or deleted completely. So we depend on amazing slashaholics like you to help fund the channel and keep it going and growing for years to come. And there's several fun ways to do that. You could join our Patreon right up there. And as a patron, you can join for as low as like $2, $5, $10 a month, on up as high as you want, and enjoy a lot of cool gifts like free ebooks, early access, exclusive content, even voicing characters and audiobooks here on the channel. You could also go to our PayPal and use the QR code right there. And uh, you can donate directly to the channel. We see all donations and we appreciate all of them. If you don't want to use the QR code or don't know how, you can use our PayPal email address, which will be in the description below and the pinned comment, as well as our Cash App uh, donation username. And a fun way to help the channel is through our Cameo right down there. Uh, on Cameo, you can ask for a birthday video, anniversary video. You can ask us to sing a song or something or ask us questions. And you can get a video from me, Alex, Sean, Master Evil, Mother Evil, the Rodeo Clown, any character from any show on the channel, or any character that I've voiced in the audiobooks. It's a fun way to help the channel. It's only $10 a video, and we'll have a lot of fun doing that. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoy tonight's content. Be excellent to each other. Please consider helping the channel. And always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. Thank you. Hey there, listeners. If you haven't done so already, before listening to tonight's Chapter 1, be sure to listen to the prologue, uh, which I released a couple months ago, because the prologue is amazing. It covers all the backstory leading up to this chapter, uh, like what happened between Tina and her dad and all of that. I know it can be confusing sometimes. You think Chapter 1 is the first upload, but there is a prologue to this book. It is here on the channel. So be sure to listen to that before chapter one, so you're caught up with all of us. Enjoy. Friday the 13th, Part 7, The New Blood, the novelization by Landon Turner. Chapter 1, Eight Years Later, Crystal Lake. Tina awoke from the vivid nightmare with a gasp. The pretty blonde 18-year-old looked around frantically and then relaxed when she saw the familiar interior of her mother's 1986 Oldsmobile. Mrs. Shepard looked over at Tina from the driver's seat with a startled expression. Her once blonde hair was now fading to a steely gray color, and her face had aged considerably, probably due to her husband's unfortunate death eight years prior. Wrinkles had started to show at the corners of her eyes and mouth. Tina had put them there. Mrs. Shepard steadied the steering wheel, trying to keep her eyes on the winding, tree-lined country road but she couldn't help but look and make sure Tina was keeping it together. Tina, honey, are you all right? I'm fine, was Tina's quick reply. It was her usual scripted reply whenever she was asked that question. She hated being asked that question because she always felt the need to lie. The truth was that she wasn't fine and hadn't been fine for some time. She was reliving that terrible night of her childhood every night. It was the same vivid reenactment every time. She could still remember the way she screamed for her father as he plunged into the lagoon. It was a nightmare that had haunted her for the last eight years. Eight long years. Eight long years of doctor's visits and always getting the same response. They couldn't understand. The only thing she could do that would bring her back to reality and solve all of her problems was to go back in time and prevent that night from ever happening however she could, and that wasn't possible. Her father was gone and he wasn't ever coming back. That was something Tina was going to have to accept. They never found his body at the bottom of Crystal Lake, so sometimes Tina still held on to hope that he was alive, out there somewhere looking for her. Some days it was all she had to hold on to to keep her from losing her sanity. As hard and as far-fetched as it was to believe, it was the only thing that kept her waking up and getting out of bed every morning. 
It could happen, though. Maybe he'd floated all the way down the lake and gotten lost. No, Tina, she told herself. He was dead. John Shepard was dead. There was no way he was alive after all these years. He had to have drowned at the bottom of the lake. There was no other reasonable explanation. Any inkling that he was still alive was nothing but her own wishful thinking. Dr. Mark Cruz, a reputable psychiatrist on all accounts, had been seeing Tina for the last three years, ever since the nightmares started, ever since she started that fire. She didn't know if she could trust him, since so many doctors before him did nothing but gaslight and manipulate Tina for her family's money. They would suggest tons of expensive and risky procedures, brain scans, MRIs, and the whole works. Of course, it was hard to make anyone understand what she was experiencing, and that was the worst part. Tina felt like she was just out of her mind. One of those grandiose and delusional schizophrenic people that believed they were Christ incarnate or that the government spies were coming to take them away. She was still seeing things that weren't there. Things kept moving on their own somehow. Dr. Cruz seemed mystified and fascinated, and to Tina, that was a warning sign. She hated being treated like some kind of science experiment. At appointments, she felt like she was in some kind of white, sterile alien spaceship, and the doctors and the psychiatrists were the little green men probing and prodding her for information. To them, she was their guinea pig. Maybe this time with Dr. Cruz would be different. Tina still felt she couldn't trust him, possibly due to the fact that he was taking them both on a weekend excursion as part of her treatment, and Tina did not like the idea, especially since he was taking her back to her old childhood home at Crystal Lake, back where it all started. Tina could feel the nervousness tingling just underneath the surface of her skin, a sensation that made her want to crawl out of her own body. The car was plunging ahead into the wilderness and into the unknown, back to Crystal Lake. She gripped the hardwood paneling on the passenger side door, dug her nails into the upholstery and took a breath. Then finally, a sign of life. A blue Volvo was coming towards them in the left-hand lane. It passed by in a blur. Tina glanced back at the passing motorist and then turned back around. She adjusted her position in the seat nervously, fidgeting with her seatbelt. Finally, she felt the urge to voice her rising anxiety that was threatening to consume her. There they were, driving out to the middle of nowhere, back to Crystal Lake after all these years. I don't think this is such a good idea, Tina said. Mrs. Shepard turned to her. Tina immediately felt guilty about complaining when she saw the look on her mother's face. Tina, honey, this is really hard on all of us. She was right, Tina thought. Her mother was also going back to where it had all happened, all out of love and support for her. She was forcing herself to go back to the place where she witnessed her husband's untimely death. Maybe she shouldn't have said anything at all, but voicing her concerns was better than sitting in silence. Will you just give it a try? Mrs. Shepard beseeched her. It doesn't seem so hard on Dr. Cruz, Tina said bitterly. He really wants to help you, Tina. I'd hate to see you go back to the hospital, her mother replied. Tina looked anxiously out the window. What her mother didn't know is that was the only reason Tina wasn't forcing her mother to stop the car. Getting out and running back down the highway and away from that awful place filled with harrowing memories. Anything was better than being locked up in that hospital, she thought. Anything. She had been locked up with all kinds of people schizophrenics, and people with extreme suicidal tendencies. It terrified Tina to think that one day she could end up like one of those sad lost people, tormented by their own brain. Then her mind drifted over to Dr. Cruz. The man had some nerve asking them all out to stay with him in a house on the lake. It seemed so unethical. If it kept her away from the hospital, then sure, she thought. But what doctor takes his patients on vacation? To Dr. Cruz, going back to the scene of her father's death would help her process those emotions. But Tina didn't believe it. What if it only served to bring up the past and bring up those emotions and make it worse? She never would be here, driving down the road back to Crystal Lake, if her father was still alive. 
they probably would have sold their house on the lake, moved back to the city, and her mother would be teaching again. They could have been one big happy family. If only. If only somehow she could go back in time, she'd do it all over again. She remembered how her last words had been, I hate you. Those words to her own father before his final moments, and it brought up the unmistakable pang of guilt. Her mind went back to the incident that got her sent to the hospital. She remembered a photograph of herself and her father when she was just a toddler. It was a picture of her in a red and blue striped parka that was too big for her, standing by the lake, hand in hand, with the late John Shepard. That was when it all started. That was when the mental breakdown happened. The one that got her sent away. She remembered gazing down at the framed photograph in her hands and feeling her eyes misting over with tears. She remembered the lump in her throat as she started to cry. She remembered the powder keg of emotions rising up inside of her, threatening to implode with just one tiny spark. Tears had dripped down onto the frame and she tasted their saltiness on her lips. Then suddenly she was overcome with something, a force, some kind of energy. It had gripped through her, rippled through her, feeling like the most intense shock waves you can imagine. Her hands had gone limp and the photo fell and smashed on the floor. And then it erupted into flames, right next to a curtain. And soon the whole entire drapes were lit ablaze. That was when her mother found her crying in a fetal position as her room burned down around her. Luckily, the fire hadn't caused too much damage and was put out quickly. Mrs. Shepard began to think it was Tina who started the fire. After all, to everyone around her, the idea that something could just spontaneously combust out of thin air was absurd. But that's what Tina said, because that's what happened. The thing was, she had no proof. It was a grief-stricken hormonal teenager's word against an adult's. She remembered thinking that they all just thought she was crazy and started the fire out of spite. It did seem ridiculous that Tina could just stare at things and cause them to burst into flames. The only other alternate explanation was that she had started the fire, negligently or otherwise. It didn't matter. They had to send her away. That's when she found Dr. Cruz who immediately took a vested interest in her above all his other patients. And that was suspicious to Tina. Her mother seemed to not notice it, but Tina could tell he was taking a unique, special interest with her. And she suspected it was the fact that he wanted to be the one who discovered the real-life Carrie for himself. I guess that's what I am, Tina thought. A real-life Carrie. That's what they called her at school. A freak. Her life was no longer about proms and dating and all the trivialities of being an adolescent. It was about doctor visits and, and tedious psychoanalysis day in and day out, and she knew that everyone in school could tell how unstable she was. It was about walking on eggshells, trying not to get triggered, and trying to avoid all of the inevitable accidents that seemed to transpire out of nowhere all around her. It was about pouring through her mind and trying to understand what had happened every day, trying to remember some hidden puzzle piece that had been tucked away somewhere in her consciousness. A missing piece that would finally make everything make sense. There had to be something she was missing. Was there? Maybe it was all a bad dream. Maybe she'd wake up any time now and she'd be in her warm bed, waking up to pancakes and sitting on her father's laps in her pajamas. But that was just too much to ask of God, Tina thought. Far too much to ask of Him. Just give me a normal life, she would pray. Just take me away somewhere far from here where I can start over. But it never happened. Nobody came to save her. If God couldn't help her, she didn't see how Dr. Cruz could do a goddamn thing for her. She was going to have to uncover her past by herself. One piece at a time. She was going to have to come to terms with whatever was wrong with her. This special gift was going to have to be examined and controlled. At least that's what Dr. Cruz had said. But she knew it would be insanely difficult to be back in that house again, back at her childhood home. There could possibly be traumatic triggers everywhere, from a rustle in the leaves to a fish splashing on the surface of the water, to even a small wave in the lake. 
The sound of wood splintering brought her back to the sound that the dock had made when it had caved in on her father on that awful night. Even though she wouldn't be alone, Tina couldn't help but think that somehow this trip would turn out to be the worst weekend of her life. Tina looked back again, out the window, and her eyes became locked on a road sign that read, Crystal Lake, 20 miles. Tina didn't know just how right she was. The winding paved road turned to dirt about five miles from Crystal Lake. It had rained that morning and thick mud splattered the sides of Mrs. Shepherd's Oldsmobile. The tall Virginia pine trees that lined the road suddenly cleared and the car pulled into a large clearing. Crystal Lake came into view, its surface glimmering in the early afternoon sun and Tina's eyes went straight to it. She half expected her father to be standing on the dock waiting for her, but there was nobody there. Her childhood home stood before them, looking lonely and isolated. The rain had weathered the white paint, and the house had now faded to a dull gray color. Some of the clapboard shutters had fallen off due to weather. It still looked the same, Tina thought. My God, it's all the same. A flock of crows scattered noisily as the car slowly drove down a winding dirt path that led around to the front of the house. Tina caught something out of the corner of her eye and her gaze was directed to a dirt-speckled jeep sitting in front of a large two-story log cabin about ten yards away from the shepherd home. Someone had lived there long ago, but the home was mostly vacant and used as a rental for as long as Tina could remember. It looked like some people were renting it now, and Tina felt a sense of relief wash over her. Maybe this wouldn't be such a bad weekend. Maybe she wouldn't feel as lonely out here if there were people nearby. Safety in numbers was surely something that she believed in. A young, attractive, and posh blonde woman in an expensive bikini and a sun hat was sunbathing in the front lawn of the log cabin next to an open cooler full of beer. Beside her, another young and petite blonde was also sunbathing in a lime green bikini. A strapping young, dark-haired man of about 20 years of age was unpacking some luggage from the back of the Jeep. As Mrs. Shepard's car drove up to the front of the house, Tina watched them as they watched her. They looked like older kids, maybe in college, but anyone beat being alone out in the woods for a weekend with her mother and her doctor. Dr. Mark Cruz was an average-looking middle-aged man with dark, coiffed hair wearing a gray blazer over a flannel shirt and slacks. His loafers were neatly shined. He stood on the front porch of Tina's childhood home, his hands in his pockets. His 1990 Buick was parked nearby. There he is, said Mrs. Shepard, as she stopped the car and turned off the engine. Bad news, Cruz, Tina remarked with a sly grin. It was what all the other patients at the hospital referred to him as whenever he wasn't in the room. Mrs. Shepard gave her a look. Tina, she said disapprovingly. Mrs. Shepard wished Tina would be a little more grateful. After all, the man was paying for their little vacation, if you could call it that. It was more like an intervention. She knew that it was hard for her to come back here after all this time and hard for her to trust people, but she wanted Tina to just try and get some help. Mrs. Shepard rolled down the window and smiled at the doctor. Hi, Dr. Cruz, she said. She gave Tina the keys. Go grab your bags, honey, she said. Hi, Dr. Cruz greeted them, flashing a smile full of pearly white teeth. Probably from some dental work that he could easily afford, Tina thought cynically. I hope we didn't keep you waiting too long, Mrs. Shepard said. No, no, Dr. Cruz replied. I really like it up here. It's beautiful. He gazed out at the lake and Tina followed his gaze. The lake even still looked the same, 
It hadn't changed at all except for the rickety old pier, which now had been rebuilt and refurbished by some neighbors. If their home hadn't been built by the shepherds themselves, there likely would have been a massive lawsuit brought up on the homeowner's agency for that old dock. Tina felt a chill down her spine as she stared out at the lake. It flashed through her mind all at once. She didn't even hear her mother's conversation with the doctor. Mrs. Shepard climbed out of the car as Dr. Cruz approached. Did you have a good trip? he asked. Oh, it was a very nice drive, she replied. Hi, Tina, how are you? Dr. Cruz called to Tina. Tina was snapped out of her trance. She turned to the doctor and forced a weak smile. Hi, she said half-heartedly. She took one last look at the lake and then went to the car and started to open the trunk to grab her bags. As she started to unlock it, she felt something again, the same feeling she had felt at the dock that night back in 1985, the same tingling sensation that she would get whenever something bad would happen. She knew they were watching her. Tina turned and looked towards the three young adults, and she was right. They were all staring at her curiously. Hi, the shorter, chubbier blonde in the green bikini called to her over the sound of the small portable radio that was blasting tunes. There goes the neighborhood, Tina heard the taller, slimmer blonde in the expensive sun hat say. Tina didn't respond. It was always the same with kids around her age. She'd get to know them, and pretty soon, once they found out just how messed up Tina was, they'd purposely ostracize her. Nobody could handle her problems. She could barely handle them herself. Maybe it would be different in this environment. Maybe she could meet a foxy guy. Maybe she could finally have a sense of normality for once in her life. And then she heard it, snickering, devious, hateful snickering. She heard the slim blonde mutter under her breath, Nice outfit. It looks like her mom dressed her. The blonde quipped nastily. So much for that idea, Tina thought. She tried not to let them see that she was self-consciously looking down at her pink sweater and slacks. Maybe if she just pretended she hadn't even noticed them, the weekend would fly by and Dr. Cruz would realize that there was nothing anyone could do to help her. Mrs. Shepard and the doctor continued with their casual conversation and went into the house, leaving Tina outside to grab the bags. So, this is the, where it all started. Dr. Cruz said as he and Mrs. Shepard stepped into the small sitting room. The interior of the home was old-fashioned and cozy. A wooden staircase with an intricate painted banister led to the second floor. An old thick oak door led to the dining room and then another led into the kitchen. Dr. Cruz helped Mrs. Shepard with her shawl and her purse and then they both stood taking in the small farmhouse. Dr. Cruz... Mrs. Shepard said hesitantly. We're doing the right thing, aren't we? Well, we have done all we can for her at the hospital, he said matter-of-factly. She just wasn't making enough progress. Mrs. Shepard took in those words with a great sense of reassurance. Now, I know it's tough for both of you to come back here after what happened. His voice trailed off as he saw the glimmer of grief in her eyes. Trust me, I will do the best I can. You'll help her, I know you will, she replied. Amanda looked in the house all at once, staring around at all the familiar knick-knacks scattered about and the smell of must. The wallpaper had started to peel and she noticed the ceiling light bulb had blown out, probably years ago. The television set where John used to sit, drink beer and watch old movies, still sat in the corner. A thin layer of dust and grime had settled on the screen. The fireplace still had ashes from the last fire they lit when they still had a family. The emotions started to hit her all at once as she remembered that single night where her entire life took a turn for the worst. All because of that old rickety dock that they never got the chance to tear down. She took a deep breath, trying to swallow the lump in her throat and keep her composure. Maybe it would be just what Tina needed. Fresh air and the birds and the sound of the lake lapping on the shore. It looked like there were some kids that had rented a cabin next door. 
maybe Tina could actually socialize and experience what it was like to be a normal teenage girl. It might be the perfect treatment. It also could turn into a nightmare. All she had to do was wait and see just what would happen. As Tina pulled her suitcase out of the back of her mother's old car, it fell, somehow unfastened itself, and its contents spilled into the leaves. Shit! The young, dark-haired man who had been unpacking his luggage next door came running over in a hurry. She heard one of the blondes stifle a laugh. She scurried down on all fours, snatching up her clothes and stuffing them back into the suitcase. Here, let me help you, the young man said, as he bent down next to Tina. No, it's okay, I got it, Tina said curtly, not looking up at him. No, really, he said kindly, and picked up one of her shirts, handing it to her. It's no problem. Tina took a glance at him and wished she didn't. She wanted to look away, but she couldn't. He was quite attractive to her. His muscles bulged in his white tank top and denim cut-off shorts. His eyes were a deep shade of chocolate. His hands seemed so strong and so masculine when hers had brushed against them. Then, as she glanced down, she saw him pick up a pair of her blue lace panties. When he noticed what they were, he looked at her embarrassed. She snatched them away, mortified. I I'm sorry, he said. Thanks, Tina said. Her tone was turned incredibly hostile. Thanks a lot. You've been a great help. I don't know what I would have done without you. The young guy heard the biting sarcasm in her voice and stood up. Hanging his head and watching her, she scooped up the suitcase and hurried towards the house, trying desperately to hide the vibrant red color that her cheeks were becoming. Great, he muttered to himself. 23-year-old Melissa Carter smirked as she watched Tina run into the house. Then her eyes cut directly to Nick and his firm ass flexing in his shorts as he also stared after Tina. She watched him as he bent down and picked up a sweater Tina had forgotten. So what do you think about Nick? The second blonde Sandra asked. I hadn't noticed, Melissa replied, lying through her teeth. Melissa was far too focused on Nick, and she had been that way from the moment she arrived at Crystal Lake. How could she not be focused on him, she thought. He was probably the most attractive man she had ever set her eyes on, and when she set her eyes on something, she always got it. It was inevitable, whether it was with her money or her parents' credit card or with sex. She always got what she wanted. Before the weekend was over, she was going to get it. Nick was going to fuck her before Sunday, before they'd all be going home and back to their lives. She just knew it. She knew it in her core. Sandra started giggling as Nick started walking back to the cabin like an ashamed dog, still carrying her sweater. How could anyone run from a guy like Nick, Melissa wondered. That girl, the one next door, must be out of her fucking mind. She knew it had been a good idea to come out to a cabin to celebrate her friend Mike's birthday with guys from her university. After all, her school was a party school and everyone knew it. She had known there would be a lot of sexy guys, and it was for almost a whole week. It would be plenty of time to really strike up conversation and eventually get someone in bed. It was a surprise party, and Mike was supposed to be arriving tonight. But knowing him, Melissa figured he'd probably show up late and arrive tomorrow. They had invited tons of people, and it was looking to be a real rager. First was Melissa's friend Sandra. She had met while working at a cosmetic store, and her boyfriend Russell, whose family owned the cabin. Then there was another couple, Ben and Kate, they had gotten to know from class. They invited a few more, and before they knew it, they had an entire vacation planned out at Crystal Lake. It was summer, and they were all mind-numbingly bored when class wasn't in session. So why not? Russell's family was loaded, and his uncle owned a cabin right on the lake. Melissa turned to Sandra. So... What do you think of our neighbors? she asked. They seem nice, Sandra said, as she sprawled back on the foldable lounge chair. Well, I think that girl dresses like someone who was definitely homeschooled, Melissa scoffed. Melissa, you are such a bitch, Sandra teased with a giggle. If there was one thing that Melissa knew, 
It was that she was all too good at being a bitch. She also knew another thing for sure. It was going to be one hell of a weekend. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 1 of Friday the 13th, Part 7, The New Blood, the novelization by Landon Turner. Been really excited to get back to this book, and I hope you enjoyed Chapter 1. We got introduced to a lot of the characters in this book. I know this movie was full of characters that just didn't have a whole lot of backstory or anything really going on with them. They were really just Jason murder fodder, and I'm fine with that. And I think Landon knew that too. So I don't expect a shit ton of backstory for each of the characters. And that's okay. You know, this movie is not about that. This movie is exactly uh, what she was saying, what Tina was saying. You know, Carrie. You know, it's like they wanted Jason versus Carrie. She's going to be the Carrie. Um, so yeah, this is definitely going to be a lot of fun to narrate. Uh, as always, when it's possible, when I haven't read a book yet... I'm narrating this. Uh, I'm reading it as I narrate it, and this is for the first time. So if any of you haven't read this book online yet, and you're hearing it, enjoying it, experiencing it for the first time, I'm right there with you. I don't know what's coming. I don't know what creative liberties Landon's going to take. Uh, but yeah, I am digging his writing style. I really loved what he did with Part 4 and Part 5. And I cannot wait to get more into Part 7. There's not a whole lot to talk about here. Uh, we mostly just got introduced to a lot of the main cast. Um, <laughs> Melissa, oh my god. Uh, I'm sure some of you got a good chuckle from uh, of the voice I'm doing for her and her friend. Uh, trust me, it's going to get even It's going to get even funnier because uh, I'm going to do my best to give these girls the bitchiest voices possible. Um, cannot wait to see the kills, or to read the kills, um, uh, really gonna have to hit this one sooner, I'm also putting out chapters of Child's Play, I'm gonna be alternating between this book and Child's Play, uh, until one of them's finished, so yeah, let me know, uh, what you all thought of the prologue, which dropped a couple months ago, on Friday the 13th, uh, what you thought of tonight's chapter, and if you're excited, uh, for this book to finally be released chapter by chapter here on the channel. Uh, also, I wanted to let everybody know, sometime uh, this spring, I will be doing an audiobook of Cabin in the Woods, uh, which is one of my favorite horror movies from the past 20 years. A subscriber has sent me an ebook version, and I'm going to narrate it here on the channel. That movie I wish could get like um, a prequel, so we could see more of what uh, these, uh, you know, at the end of the movie, Cabin in the Woods, I don't want to spoil it for too many people, but you see all the possibilities of what could have been the monsters or the creatures or the ghosts or whatever. I would absolutely love a prequel to be written to that movie so we could see more selections from that place. But in the meantime, all we have is the movie, and soon we will have the audiobook narrated here on the channel. I'm excited about that. I'm also going to be uh, completely re-narrating Friday the 13th uh, books from the Black Flame series, Carnival, um, sorry, Church of the Divine Psychopath, maybe Hell Lake, I'm not completely sure on that one yet, uh, but definitely Hate Kill Repeat. Uh, and I'll be uh, re-narrating a couple of the Freddy books, like The Dream Dealers, uh, let's see here, Suffer the Children, and Protégé. But uh, anyways, I'm going to go for now, folks. Uh, Really excited. Can't wait to get back to this. I'll see you very soon. But before I go, please consider joining the Patreon. All the information to join it is in the description below and the pinned comment. You can also just do a PayPal donation to the channel, a Cash App donation to the channel, or you can order a $10 Cameo video from me or anybody here on the channel. I can do it as uh, any of the voices I've ever done on the channel. Freddy, Chucky, whatever. Uh, even uh, subtle characters from books, if you might have enjoyed them. Uh, it's, it definitely helps the channel continue to go and grow, since we cannot monetize the channel here on YouTube. So please consider helping the channel in one of those ways below in the description. Until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying, Thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. Good night, everybody.